show. My name is Jack McLean. I'm your host. And today we have Pete Burridge. He's the first team athletic performance coach at Bristol Bears Rugby in England. His key topic today will be how to develop top end speed in field based team athletes. And for those new to the podcast, our mission here at Prepare Like a Pro is to inspire aspiring athletes and staff with practical knowledge from some of the industry's most inspiring individuals and to strengthen the AFL community. If you like the show, please show your support by following us on Instagram and subscribing to the podcast. We're on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. Welcome, Pete. Thanks for jumping on, mate, and, and good morning. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for jumping on. For those that aren't aware of your work, um, do you just want to give us a quick little uh, intro into your background before working at the Brisbane Bristol Bears? Yeah, sure. Um, so like most uh, SNC coaches, I was a failed soccer player. Um, and then uh, went to, to Loughborough University, or as the, one of my Aussie friends who went to Loughborough, they call it Luga Baruga. Um, from there, I uh, did an internship at Leicester Tigers Rugby Club, and that was probably my first real proper intro into s and as I know it. Like, again, during, during university, I was exposed a little bit to the gym, but really had no idea what I was on about, no idea what I was doing. Um, and then from that internship, I did a brief internship at Tottenham Football Club, then to Leicester City Football Club. Um, and from there, then did two years in the public sector working at Exeter University. Um, and then got the call to go back to Leicester Tigers, worked there for six seasons um, before, yeah, heading heading back down southwest, which is where I'm from in England, uh, to Bristol Bears. Uh, I've been here now for, this is my third season. Um, yeah. Oh, very good. And for those taking on internships, uh, why do you think Leicester Tigers invited you back, mate? That's a good stint. Six seasons at a professional club after uh, doing an internship. That's pretty much the ideal uh, goal for anyone that's taking an internship. If you're lucky enough to get one in elite sport, uh, yeah. what do you think? Looking back in hindsight, what would be some good tips uh, to have a successful internship at elite club? Um, I think... The, the first part was like, I, I remember the gap in between when I, when I was leaving Leicester, I was desperate to stay on, like desperate. I really, really wanted to, um, to get kept on, but actually the year before, so I, I'd finished my three years at uni and then went straight into wide world of work. But the year before me, uh, there was a, a guy who's actually a really, really good operator who did two years, a sandwich year, went back to finish at uni and then came back. Uh, and he was sort of shoehorned for the, for the position. And I was like, at the time, like, oh man, like I really, really wanted to stay on. Like I really loved the environment um, and he was coming back and he's a fantastic practitioner and like, yeah, he, he he deserved to to come back and he innovated while I was away. Um, but the one thing that I did manage was I was actually an intern sports scientist. So maybe more the GPS, the data side and actually going away and ex being exposed to uh, say a football environment where, you basically do everything. Like if you're the GPS guy, you're also the guy that takes the fitness sessions. You're also the guy that picks up the rehabbers. Um, I got a little bit more of a taste of the S&C side of things. Um, and then especially when I was at X to uni for two years, again, that was probably a lot less glamorous working with athletes who are maybe a little lower level um, or in sports that aren't as high profile. Um, the one thing that you get there is you get a ton of coaching experience. And so that was where, that love of S and C was really solidified, and I still have a bit of a background in in the sports science, but I'm I'm kind of a fully fledged athletic performance coach, which is yeah the guy on the gym floor, the guy on the field, rather than being the the data analyst who's spending his time on R coding and um, looking at like yeah GPS reports. Like I, I'm I scan over these now, but yeah I, I've I found what I love, which is actually the like on the gym floor with people. So. Um, yeah, having that time away was probably the best thing for me. Um, mm. But one thing that I did manage to do was I made sure that I always was in contact with the guys at Tigers. Uh, I was lucky that I was just down the road with the football club. So it was very easy geographically to come back. Um, but then even when I was in uh, Exeter Uni, which was about three and a half, four hours away from, from Leicester Tigers, in the sort of university holidays, they get like, say, a month off, I would then go maybe do a week where I would actually spend time um, living with one of the coaches uh, and going in for the days um, and just like lending a hand. But 
like it, it worked two ways. Like they were getting an extra pair of hands for free. Um, I was able to kind of tap into their knowledge and ask some questions, who they're speaking to, um, how have things developed and actually seeing the program evolve. And I think because I was still having my finger on the pulse, I guess, of what was going on in that environment and staying in touch, I may have stayed in the mind of the, the people doing the hiring. So when there was a position, what, four years later, um, mm. I was the person that they called. So uh, yeah, I was I was very lucky to to be able to do that. But in terms of advice, yeah, definitely like don't just do your internship and then like say goodbye say and that's it. Actually, yeah, yeah. I ask questions. Continue to to like again. These people that you you've interned under can be your your mentors. And like I, I was very lucky enough to work in a fantastic um, department with loads of people that I'm still in contact with now in different topics and. Like, yeah, they, they've been class to mentor me. So guys like Alex Martin, um, who's now uh, heading up at uh, Bath Rugby, Ed Gannon, who's now in America and Buffalo Sabres, Andy Shelton, who's uh, basically running Kitman Labs, um, Dave Cripps, who's killing it in the private sector. And he, he's the sort of soft skills guy. Um, Shane Lehane, who I, I know you've had on, who's now obviously in Oz. And so like, yeah, I, I was very lucky to, to kind of jump into an environment where there were lots and lots of really, really good coaches. And uh, for a short spell, we had Ollie Richardson before he went to uh, Oz and to Japan. So like, yeah, as, a, as, a, as in terms of a melting pot of, of knowledge and experience, like it was unbelievable. And so mm. like I, I knew pretty early on, like, wow, I'm very lucky to be in this position. I need to kind of keep my head down, work really hard and just be curious the entire time. Cause there's so much experience that I can tap into here. Um, yeah, so I, I think I think that's probably the advice oh, I'd give yeah. you. That's great advice, mate. Like you said, don't sort of complete an internship and if you don't get the result, just leave it there. Actually stay engaged and uh, make the most of the resources and um, whether it pays dividends in terms of a job or just making you a better practitioner, you're going to reap the rewards. So I think that's uh, yeah. Yeah, success leaves clues and, and that's clearly some, some nice clues there and a good way to kick it off. Uh, you mentioned um, being a, a football uh, player or soccer for in Australia. Um and then uh, wanting to be working in elite sport, uh, sports science was your first internship, and then you gravitated more this sort of the strength and conditioning. For those that aren't sure um, whether to go down the sports science or data analytics, a performance analyst role or, or strength and conditioning, what were some of the things where it became quite obvious to you that you're more passionate and you had more skill set towards the uh, athletic performance side of things? Um, I think I, I just sort of remember like what your day to day responsibilities are. Um, and obviously as a sports scientist, it's collecting and collating the data and the GPS and stuff and um, downloading and doing those bits. And those are tasks that if say you train in the afternoon, um, yeah, your sort of late afternoon is spent yeah, downloading the GPS, getting it to the main sports scientists that they can do the, the real in-depth analysis. Um, and while that was going on, a lot of the SNC coaches had finished their gym sessions with the players because the players had gone home. And so at that point they would then go into the gym and they would train. Um, mm. And I was always sort of, because the the office had a glass window that backed onto the gym. So you could see all of your colleagues going gymming and they'd be like chatting through bits and like stuff like projects or like topics that they've been talking about in the office. And you're like, Oh, I really want to be listening to those conversations. or I really want to, ask this coach why we're doing lifts of three rather than lifts of six or something or I want to know what like why like you lift at this percentage rather than that percentage and I could just tell that like my curiosity was a lot more with that and obviously I couldn't mm. because I was almost chained to the desk downloading the GPS units and sorting those things out and doing that main bit of the role um, that I was always finding myself wanting to do that as soon as I can so I could get into the gym, not just to train for myself, but actually to be around the other coaches and ask those questions. And I started to realize that maybe that was the, the area of passion of mine. Yeah. Um, fast forwarding to the future when like we when I was sort of managing the placement student program at Leicester Tigers when I was back, um, we, we ran a, a system of, of majoring and minoring in, in, uh, in a certain field. So like mm. if during the sort of interview you were a guy who was very, very keen on data analytics, but you also wanted to maybe have a little, you were interested in performance analysis. So like, again, like videoing, coding, using sports code, your main role would be in the sports science, but we would try where possible to get you, whether that's a crossover week where 
you do, you spend a week as a performance analyst intern, or whether we would try and integrate you with their performance analyst interns to work on projects in the same way as, again, for most SNC coaches, again, within rugby at least, the, yeah, the athletic performance coach is usually the guy in the gym, but not all environments are built like that. Like I said, in football, if you're the guy in the gym, you also have to be the guy that knows how to run the GPS data. So it's actually a very like good skill to have to at least be aware and understanding of what a catapult system looks like, what a stat sports system looks like and how to at least get the basic data. What are you, what are some of the things that to look for? What questions do you need to ask? It doesn't necessarily need, mean that you're like all of a sudden, yeah, building your own, kind of software package on Tableau or Power BI, but at least being able to, if you are then applying for those entry level jobs, you can hopefully show that, yeah, I can at least have, I can download the catapult units and I can understand a few basic metrics to look for. And then if that's an element of my job that I, I need to dive deeper in, then you do that later down the line. But yeah, yeah, being able to be exposed to multiple things, I think is key. And I think, yeah, for those, those interns that are like, looking at the as the season goes on you're like shit right I've got to start applying for jobs now like it's about making yourself as employable as you can so having experience with the analysts looking at sports code or huddle or something like that and understanding how to access that looking at the SNC coaches and understanding how to program or what software you, you use um, and some of the basic principles of like progressive overload and, and things like that so the sports scientists, it's yeah, looking at the GPS, it's understanding heart rate data and what that tells you. And yeah, just just having a broader knowledge, I think, makes you a lot more employable. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. That's great advice, mate. For, for that early on in your in your face, it's going to pay dividends for later on. Like you mentioned, the sports science, where you'll you'll still currently look over reports now and how it can inform you for for some of your decision making. So um, couldn't agree more. For for those. Um, like looking back at your career to date, are there any highlights or moments that you're um, proud of that you'd like to share? Yeah, like it's a great question because actually, like if you think about it deeply, like everyone wants to hear the the superstars that you work with or the the wins, which unfortunately for me haven't been uh, haven't really won much much uh, silverware over the course of my career so far. So maybe it's just something to do with me. I don't know, but um, uh, yeah, like the, the the highlights that stick out to me are actually um the people that I've influenced it sounds corny but like it's actually those guys so like when I worked in the academy it was a, a kid um who we knew was never going to progress out of the academy just didn't have the physiology but he was a kid that tried really hard and actually at the under 18 level he reached the, probably the peak of his rugby career that he'll ever he'll ever reach and we mm. we knew that he might have not known that at the time but being able to like he probably shouldn't have even been there in the first place, but through working with him and improving some of his physiological qualities and actually influencing some of his behaviors off the field, he turned into a really, really good uh, professional who unfortunately didn't have the the talent perhaps to dine at the top table, but like was at a level that he was able to be serviceable um, in the under 18s and actually held his own with some of the people who were a lot, had a lot more potential than he did. Um, mm. And yeah, memories like that stick out. Um, a couple of players, like there's a, one player who I worked with who was come up from the championship up to the premiership um, and perhaps it was his last chance at the big leagues. He, he's a fairly veteran player, but like this was his last chance, one year contract. Maybe he wasn't good enough. We're not sure. But actually through working with him, like he worked really, really hard we improved his physical qualities and he actually ended up getting a second contract and he's still actually at the club. So it's, it's things like that, that they might not be the star player that everyone knows about, but those, those kind of characters that you like, actually I've been able to influence them and impact them in, in a positive way. And um, yeah, those memories I think um, one, of, one of the funny memories that stick out uh, again, another kid in the Academy um, again, outside of, OK, I've got their squat up or they're able to run their 10 meter time faster is actually influencing them in in life. Um, so I had a uh, a kid come up to me and like he got ratted out by a few of his mates. He's like, oh, this kid's got something to tell you. And I'm like, what? Like, and he's like, oh, like I, he was a bit of a nervous kid and like a little bit overweight, but he got into a lot better shape. He's like, oh, I, yeah, I was chatting to a girl and I ended up like 
going back with her and I ended up losing my virginity and we ended up he ended up standing up on a bench in front of 30 lads just shouting like oh, I've got a huge announcement to make like Anchorman um, and then he shouted out like oh yeah I've, I've lost my virginity uh, and then the amount of energy in the room uh, from yeah these 18 year olds like whooping and hollering like it was, and like, he, he sort of put it down he was like yeah like the, being in the gym and being with the rest of the lads gave me the confidence like just being able to have the banter and stuff the chat um, and then being in maybe a bit bit better physical nick uh yeah, helped him with yeah yeah that that shouldn't be a a prime memory but that's certainly one that sticks out in my mind of actually some of the sort of warm fuzzy feelings that when when you actually sit back and look you're like yeah you've actually made a really positive influence on someone's life whether that whether they've got a contract whether they're getting the start and the jersey or not actually influencing them in wider life is sometimes as as if not more important um, yeah. so yeah that, that's probably the the things that I, I would suggest and yes yeah, it's, it's probably more the celebrating the process over the prize rather than um the silverware although who knows if if we start winning a lot a lot of stuff at bristol and i've got some gold medals around my neck i, I might change my tune but yeah for the minute it's about the people no well said mate and looking back at those moments what skill sets or or um in terms of your craft what, what things held you in good stead to really help those athletes and, and make an impact and, and a positive influence like you mentioned I think when I, when I look back to my time in the academy, I was a bit of a younger coach, still old enough to hopefully hold some respect over them. But like it comes down to like, what what were they interested in? Like, and pretty much it was gaming, girls, and rugby. And like when I looked at what my interests were, it was gaming, girls, and rugby. <laughs> so I think it was a bit, a bit bit of an easy easy mesh to kind of understand like. Yeah, we would chat to some of these 18 year olds. I, I would chat about the 18 year olds about like, um, yeah, playing Fortnite or Call of Duty or FIFA or what games they were playing and who was good, who was bad in the group. And then like chatting about rugby and like, yeah, they were just so invested like in being a professional rugby player that they loved it and they loved sport and they loved getting better. And that was that resonated with me because I'm someone, yeah, that like loves kind of constantly improving and challenging my own understanding and. Like, yeah, they, they were really, really uh, good at like, asking questions as, oh, why are we doing this? And why is this helping us? And me getting a platform to be able to explain those things and influence them was was, was really valuable. Um, mm. So, yeah, I guess part of it is leveraging your own personality. So, like, again, I was well, well fitted with what they were into were the things that I was into. So there was instant connections. Um, but, yeah, like, I, I think sometimes that those soft skills that go unspoken about sometimes are key and I think I think now like where for example like I'm a bit older and um, work with first team players when we get new players new signings it's finding that like initial starter topic that you know they're interested in so like um, I think back to a few of the new signings from this year uh, there's one guy who's really into American football and so like every Monday we'll chat about his fantasy American football team. Uh, and that's our starter topic to then grow out to like, okay, how's the body feeling? How's the family, et cetera, et cetera. But we'll start pretty much every day with our, how, how do you go in fantasy? Like, and chatting through American football, like somebody else. Um, and this was actually a, a little bit uh, earlier on in my career uh, was maybe as a staff member who was high up in the organization, but was someone who was quite stern, quite serious and, maybe quite hard not very approachable um mm. but one of the things that i'd realized in the office that he came alive with whenever we whenever we spoke about it he's he was really into cycling uh, and it's not really a topic that i knew a lot about but I, at the time because I, I wasn't getting paid i had to cycle to work and so i was cycling in and like thinking about getting a new bike and so i was kind of smart with who I chose to talk to it about. I was like, oh, I'm looking to get a new bike that you like cycling, don't you? And he just came alive and he was talking to me about, oh, you want to get this bike, but this one's too expensive. For you. But this one, this one's a really good value one. And oh yeah, this cyclist cycles on this. And like, you could just see that topic came alive. And like that then became a good little in so that there was a lot of other people in the office that he was this kind of big, scary senior member of staff. And because I had my topic where we just talk about cycling every now and again, like I was then able to ask him that, like, okay, when, when you're rehabbing someone from this, what, like, uh, what's your thought process? And he'd be a lot more approachable. So I think navigating that and understanding, like leveraging the topics that both you're interested in and that the 
the end user, whether that's a, a staff member or, or a player or interested in, I think is, is key to growing those relationships. And that becomes the start point. And then obviously, as you get to know each other, it becomes two way. They understand the topics that are important to you and you understand their topics that are important to them and the people that are important to them. Yeah, I think those soft skills are maybe something that you can only really develop through time in, but like mm. certainly being kind of aware of them and being actually putting like conscious effort and thought into that can can sometimes help um like in in some ways yeah no that's great advice mate thank you for sharing that and like you said it's something that can sometimes get overlooked but like you mentioned both from working with academy elite athletes and, and even staff that um having that connection piece can uh, make a big difference before you get into the nitty-gritty of the strength conditioning or tapping into how their body feels you got to first build that trust and respect right yeah ex exactly you can't just go straight in with like okay what well, like yeah linear block periodization whatever and then just talking about rep schemes and stuff because it's like you're probably not going to be faced with um good response yeah, good response. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. turn the place into a library pretty quick um yeah what, what, on the flip side mate challenges uh, no doubt in elite sport there's, there's challenges along the way um what what have you learned from some of your most significant challenges and, and if you don't mind sharing some that you've faced and, and what yeah how you've grown from them yes so i think back to like the differences almost between pro sport and the public sector so like working at a, in a university environment and some of the pros and cons like pro sport like my time at leicester was quite a it was a bit of a whirlwind we, i think we ended up with five coaches in six years and so differences in game models differences in like how coaches wanted to operate and with so much churn in terms of the staff at the very top, there was also differences in like the attack coach, the defense coach, and there was influences in the background around like the player group. Um, and then what we did SNC wise and the, the politics of that at the time and the politicking that was going on between certain members of the, um, the organization wasn't really that great. Um, and so, yeah, was exposed to maybe some of the darker side that, left a bit of a bitter taste in in my mouth and quite a few other people's mouths who um who experienced it and so that was something that i, I found a little bit unsavory um but learning like okay like okay do i want to be a coach who steps on other people to get to the top or am i someone that wants to just stay true to what i believe in and then if that means you don't get put forward for jobs or actually people are gunning for your position and someone wants to get rid of you then like at least you've been true to yourself and I, th I think that was the way that I went um with yeah some of the influences that, and they're not necessarily around like actual coaches it was kind of senior like board board level uh type people and making decisions on things that perhaps they weren't really understanding truly of like they didn't see things day to day they were making decisions based off of discussions that coaches or players were having off-site um, who were perhaps politicking and so being aware of that took a bit of the sheen off of the okay like this is a cutthroat business and again sometimes people don't want to take responsibility when results don't go your way and so you have to be aware of of that and that some people can turn and so then it, it then means you've got to be be certain of your processes because when someone from the board level is going okay why on earth is this guy doing this or why have you got injuries here are they going to want to know about your process so you got to make sure that your your process is is watertight um but then on the flip side of that like actually in pro sport the level of autonomy that you have and the um like higher stakes that you work with where it is it's fast paced and there are like again you're playing in front of however many fans and there are jobs on the line like that's high pressure but actually that's sometimes where, where you want to operate because that's where you, you do your best work whereas like on the other side of that in the public sector working at a university setting like it was a lot more slow paced uh, a job you could retire to and not really think too hard or too deep about um, but at the same time it was quite boring like there wasn't really many stakes like winning university bucks medals wasn't that's not a large competition and uh, you're working with an athlete who's barely above recreational standard um and you're like right okay like i've gone from working with a british lion or an international caliber athlete or premiership footballer and now i'm working with 
like Susan, who does fencing uh, and is good at fencing because no one else in the country does fencing. Um, and she can like she's barely like in the gym, let alone doing anything. And you're like, yeah, this is somewhat different to what I'm used to. And um, yeah, like some of the the micromanagement around around the university setting was, was sometimes difficult. But at the same time, like, yeah, it was a lot more slow paced. It was relaxed, low pressure. Um, but yeah, you got, got long holidays. You get a chance to do loads of CPD in your holidays where you could go visit environments. Whereas in pro sport, like, yeah, your off season is when they have their off season and it's yeah, pretty much balls to the wall until that point. And by that point, you're so wound down that actually it's tough to get out into different environments because you can only get there for a day because you, you've got to be at a game and stuff. So yeah, I think when I contrast the two, like I'd say, yeah, those are some of the challenges of of both. And there's there's pros and cons to, to each of those environments. But yeah, I, I think yeah, looking back at the, some of the dark times at Leicester, like that, that taught me a lot around okay, who I wanted to be as a coach and okay, some of the like naivety of like, like I'm quite a positive person, but understanding that, yeah, at times, yeah, people operate in the shadows and sometimes it's just being a good bloke isn't enough. You actually have to, um, you have to influence players to the point that they back your corner because unfortunately sometimes the the people who are, are making decisions are influenced more by what a player tells them than what a senior member of staff does. So um, mm. yeah, I'd say those yeah. are some of the challenges. Some great learning there uh, in, in some challenging times, no doubt. But you, you talked a couple of things that'd be good to unpack and then we'll get into the key topic. Um, but um, how important it is to be um, clear with your processes? Uh, can you talk to us about that? What might be from a rehab point of view or from an athlete development point of view, but what would be an example of how you know, some big rocks to focus on for a practitioner in terms of being clear with their processes and being able to uh, communicate that to whether it be a, a board member or, or a coach, maybe someone outside of the department of high performance. Yeah. So this is probably inference. We ended up having uh, two reviews from Tim Gabbett, um, like reviewing our process. And so like straight away from, from that perspective, you know, okay, you're going to be looking at like your workload and have you managed someone's workload effectively, whether, that, and that's like an, an on pitch way, but actually in a gym setting, that needs to be the same as well. So like we've all probably dealt with a failed RTP that in hindsight's 2020, where you look back and you're like, ah, yeah, maybe I pushed a bit too hard here, or I was a bit too conservative with, with this. I should have done that a bit earlier and like closed, closed the gap a little bit quicker here. And maybe we push this player back, but uh, a bit too soon. And those kind of questions in your, in your head that are constantly going around, but like, yeah, I would say, it's just making sure you, you you're able to answer the why. So like, okay, why did you um, expose this guy to a day on day off stimulus? Oh, okay, because he's got um, issues with his tendons, and so that he we have to reduce his training load because he can't do two stimuli back to back because that flares up his Achilles tendon. So that means he can only go Monday, Wednesday. Wednesday's the day off. We train Monday, Tuesday. So he only trains Monday. He's sat down on the Tuesday. We can do some off feet work, but he's not training with the group so that he can train effectively on Thursday so that he's ready for Saturday. And so it's that understanding those decision makings of like, OK, why have you decided to do that? Or, OK, like with your gym program, like why is this player on such low volume? Well, it's like, well, actually, um, strength and hypertrophy really isn't his need right now. And I need to spend more of my bullets either um, getting him fresh or we're doing more conditioning work. And so I'm actually utilizing more of my yeah units of of work doing conditioning and making sure that he's fresh to be able to still play at the end of the week um so his gym program reflects that and answering the why there whether that's a yeah a coach asking you that uh in a player review or a player going like okay well why am i doing why am i doing so much why am i having to do these extras when other players aren't well okay and having evidence so it's like based on fact rather than opinion so um that could be right. Okay. Look, you're someone who's probably three, four kilos underweight in this review that we had at the start of the year where everyone's positive. You said that you want it to be bigger, faster, stronger. And actually one of your work ons is, is building a bit more muscle in your upper body. Or well, now we're in the middle of December and it's dark and you don't want to do the work and it's post session, but 
we said we would do this earlier on in preseason where everyone's a winner. And then now we're in the, the sticky end of the season where you just want to go home and it's dark and you like, you don't want to put the work in, but actually I've, I've got to challenge you here that you need to put the work in here because we still need to close that, that gap. Um, so it's, yeah, ha- having, being able to explain the why so that when you get those kind of tough questions back, you have an answer for them and that it's, it's, is a good one. Uh, I think back to, um, something that sticks out to me is that in, in Daniel Kahneman's book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, is he, he says about uh, doing the pre-mortem or, or spotting the car crash before it happens. So like almost picturing those conversations with the player who's just being a bit of an ass of like, OK, why do I have to do that? And being a bit of a sap, like make sure that you're going into that conversation prep with, OK, if he really flips out, what are my options? What's my explanation? So that if he's really, really adamant, he's not doing it. Can I negotiate down to all right? We won't do this false prescription, but we can. Can we at least get this? Yes or no? Or if he's just curious as to why, and he's still going to do it anyway, but he, he's not bought in. Okay, wh- what's my sell? What's my message going to be to this player to actually get him to buy into to what we're doing a bit more? And yeah, sometimes going in prep beforehand can be huge to like the clarity that you, you give players, and then that also gives them confidence that like you know what you're doing and that you've got their best interests at heart and you're not just, they're not just being a guinea pig for something you've read on the internet and decided, oh, that looks good. I'm just going to run it on this player. Like you've actually got their best interests at heart. So yeah, I I think that's a a key key message as well. Yeah. And then this next part might be blend into two, but the politics and how that can get quite um, dark at times and people pulling people down uh, and how important it was to stick to your values of, of being a practitioner that you want to be. Uh, even if that means um, sacrificing progression and getting the next role or, or you know, fast progression and just taking taking your time and being proud of how you conduct yourself, uh, but also in the same light of uh, influencing and making an impact with the with the players and, and ensuring that they're really clear on the impact you're having on the program. Uh, talk us about, I guess, the game of elite sport, maybe if you want to frame it that way or how to, how to be able to yeah, have people on your side, not just staff that you work closer with, but also the players and and juggling the politics when it when it gets pretty dark. Yeah, I think probably the it comes down to like basic things of like trust and respect, and like trust takes years to earn, and it can take one moment to lose in an instant. So, like it's it's a tough line. Sometimes you have to dance with players because ultimately you answer to the coaches and to the board or whatever, and the players are part of that. But sometimes you have to have those tough conversations with players or you have to feed things up, up the chain um, that, okay, this player isn't working hard enough or, okay, here's a report showing that this player hasn't progressed as much as he should have. And we've tried to influence behavior, but he, he hasn't really bought in. And that then leads to kind of bigger issues around like, okay, like places in the team or even worse, like, come contract time they might not get contracts and stuff so like it's tough to to navigate that where you're you're trying to inform um and yeah like expose the coaches to what's what you're seeing while still having the players interests at heart because sometimes they can be quite conflicting um so it's a tough like line to dance at times um but something that like as i've got older you've got to realize that at the end of the day if as long as you want the best for the team as a whole sometimes that is actually that does involve being in conflict with a player to challenge them to be the best that they can be and sometimes you might as a as a player group you might end up leaving a few players behind because they might not have the um the traits that you're after as a culture and as a playing group um in the same way as from a staffing perspective um I haven't really been involved in it too much within my own department within athletic performance but like I've, you hear stories where you've got like kind of toxic work cultures where like the the athletic performance staff are like at loggerheads with the physios and the physios are throwing the S&Cs under the bus and the S&Cs are throwing the physios under the bus. Like that wouldn't be a good environment for me to work in, uh, I, I don't think, because you don't have that trust and you're just constantly kind of watching your back because you just know that as soon as an error is made or mistakes made, like someone's gunning for each other, whereas really you 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 should be collaborative and trying to work together and like it's about taking ownership I guess like sometimes yeah a, a player might have got injured um or re-injured or not perform and it might not be completely to do with you it might be to do with other things but actually 
owning your bit and maybe taking ownership for uh, the whole like kind of trust with people who know ah, okay yeah like, I, I may have fucked up here but like he's sort of taken the fall for me or he's he's fronted it up with a coach beforehand which has softened how that coach thinks about what I've done uh, like th- those are those are things that aren't forgotten uh, I think and I think yeah you you can have those those kinds of chats when you're up managing uh, coaches or, or players that I think I think can go a long way um, to yeah to earn those trusts within departments so that you have a, a good working relationship um, it's just a tough one when you when you work with someone perhaps like who doesn't always have those values in in mind that you just have to be aware and like it doesn't necessarily mean you can't work with them like you just got to understand that okay like I can't have as an open conversation with them because you know that might get back to x y or z or actually they're always looking for the for the cell to take credit for something and it's like right okay like that can actually be leveraged and you can still have a very good working relationship with that person if you leverage that correctly as long as you know the playing field that you're on like i guess you you spoke about it being a game and i, I hate describing it as that but yeah sometimes you do have to play the game with a player or a coach and that means like saying certain things to a player or like it could be for example like um i think of and I like an example for playing the game with a with a player might be you understand that scientifically the rationale behind this training strategy isn't strictly true, but it's one that resonates with the player, and you know that that's a topic that they're keen on, and it's a message that they they want to hear. You can go right, okay, we're going to do this because it's doing what you think it is, even though scientifically I know it really isn't. But as long as I get you to believe it, then I've, I've played the game with you. You're bought in. We're all good. Even though if I was to go up in front of a, yeah, a present in front of yeah, a group of S&C coaches, they'd be like, that's completely false. That's not the reason why. Um, you're like, yeah, I know. But like for the player. Um, so I try, I try to think of an example. Like it might be you know, a player who likes gimmicks and is wearing a altitude mask. We know that it's not got anything to do with altitude, Matt, like in terms of changing the altitude, it's just making it a bit harder to, to get air in, which subjectively makes the RPE of a session a little bit harder. And the player goes, oh yeah, I'm training at altitude. And yeah, I feel so much like better for it. I feel so much fitter. And you're like, yeah, okay, cool. Like just don't <laughs> tell any of the other SNC coaches. Yeah, because <laughs> they're going to like um, shoot me down. But yeah, like that's a message that as long as you're believing it and you're happy with it, okay, I'm happy to live that live for a spell. Um, before I yeah, burst your bubble by saying actually it's not doing what you think it's doing um, but yeah, yeah I think things I love it mate there's so much nuance in in what we do working with uh, yeah in the complexity of working with human beings in performance so it's great to shed light on on this but yeah let's let's get into the topic that you're most passionate about and like we talked a little bit about off air how it started to really um, skyrocket uh, in, you know in terms of people getting in contact and asking questions and, and getting gaining some great momentum and it is a pretty exciting topic in speed working with elite athletes but uh, first I guess if you're preparing a whole squad of anywhere between 30 and 45 athletes and you might have a couple of support staff in this warm-up what do you think is the best way practically to to prepare someone to hit, you know be ready for max velocity and but also from a long-term perspective improve speed qualities I guess from a technical point of view yeah I think stripping it right back you first of all you you've got to ask the question of like the why answer the why so if it's a a warm-up like you can categorize warm-ups like it might be that we're targeting acceleration it could be we're targeting max velocity qualities it could be that the main focus of the warm-up is actually improving their skills or having a bit more like vibe or energy fun engagement and so then that kind of colors what you then choose in terms of the what um so like yeah if max velocity is is one of the things that you're, you're trying to develop then you're probably going to be looking at more if you're going to do some drills you're going to be looking at max velocity based drills whether that's um wall drills in positions that are more vertical in nature or um yeah like uh the a drills and things like that and they would provide the context towards the end goal which might be a max velocity sprint it could be that actually you want a more integrated closed loop where okay they might have that drill they might sprint at top end speed but you want it to be more relevant to the game so the end point might be uh i don't know a two-on-one over a large space where they're up to close to max velocity um, but they might be moving offline and having to make a decision on a pass or a kick or something um, is then working back from that okay if that's the end point okay 
how do I prep them for that? It might be that I need to prep their hamstrings. So we're going to do a few fly runs, building up speed. Okay. I've got that in my, in my plan. Okay. I can actually layer in some learning and education. Okay. What's the first step of that, right? That might be the positions that I want them to get into. So what, what positions uh, do I need at max velocity to perform that skill in the 2v1 effectively? That might be right pelvic position. So then my drills, my drill choices are around, right? Okay. What's going to help develop pelvic position. So that might be right. Okay. I'm going to do an a walk drill, stripping it right back to the most simple uh, thing. And what's the why there. I want to teach them about their pelvic position in space. So, okay. It might be to do with front side mechanics to do that effectively. You're going to need more of a neutral pelvis or posteriorly tilted pelvis compared to most guys that run with their bum behind them in an anterior pelvic tilt. So while I'm in the drills in that closed setting, I might be coaching the pelvic position. So the pelvic position unlocks the, what we call the hammer high position or that front side knee lift. Right. Okay. So why is he not getting the front side knee lift? That's because his pelvic position isn't right. Right now let's go coach that pelvic position for a couple of minutes in the prep. Okay. They do that. They then go into their fly runs where they're building up good. Okay. As they build up, they tense up, which then like they dump their pelvis out behind them again, which limits their front side lift, which limits the amount of force they can whack down into the ground. Also is a high risk of injury from a hamstring perspective with that backside mechanics. So, right. Okay. Let's coach this at speed, right? Okay. Pelvic position. It might be a cue, right? Um, pu push your belt buckle forwards or tuck your hips underneath you or whatever the analogy you want to use running up a flight of stairs, whatever that is. Um, right. Do that. Now they can do it in a fairly close setting at speed right now. Let's get a ball involved. Okay. Ideally now I don't want them thinking about their pelvic position. I want them thinking about what the defender's doing and their decision-making and, uh, their skill execution. But now I'm stress testing. Can they do that skill that we've practiced in a really, really slow controlled setting in an a walk where they're just lifting their leg up, walking and marching. Now it's stress test completely at top end speed with chaos involved. Um, so yeah, it's building around the why. Um, mm -hmm. And one, one of the um, frameworks that we use is, is prep perform play. So again, prep is that first bit of providing the context. That's where you get your educational message. Perform is, okay, can you do it now at relevant speeds or angles? And then play is yeah, the, the chaos of the game. Um, so a, a, another uh, way of describing that is uh, drill skill chaos. Um, I, th I think that came from England sevens. Um, well, that's where I think I heard it first, but yeah, having those frameworks to go, okay, right. Be logical with where you're going. Um, yeah. It's, is important. I think. Yeah. And with managing large groups to, to keep it in, engaging, um, do you break them into small groups at times and do rotations? How many coaches are involved? Talk us through, I guess, the practical logistics side of, um, yeah, yeah. How you sort of facilitate a session. So at Bristol, we're really lucky because we've got like the entire department is really interested in speed and we've got some really good deliverers of speed. So like a lot of us are comfortable and we'll, there'll be, we have the, um, the ability to split guys and bucket guys into small groups so that we can work on things that are maybe a little bit more individual. Um, but at the same time, I know that not many environments are lucky enough to have four or five coaches on the floor being able to um, coach one group at one time. Um, so sometimes, yeah, sessions are one on 30 and so then you've then got to understand okay is it best for me to work on the individual is it best to get my message across to the team and maybe not get the depth of learning so one of the ways that that that's helped me is um like maybe you set your stall out at the early stage of your session okay this is what we're going to work on this is why this is how it's going to transfer go right okay, you set your groups up when you're doing drills um, it might be that you're setting them up in a way where you group them in twos or threes and get some peer coaching going on, even if they don't really know what's the kind of nuance of what, what they're doing, but they can at least see and perhaps parrot some of the cues that you might be using. Um, from there, again, how you set your group up. So like we do a lot of like waterfall starts so that my coaching eyes can see each individual run. So let's say you've got 30 guys and you group them into fives when they're doing a fly run. Um, so you just set the far guy goes and then you just get this waterfall getting closer and closer. So each one you're like, right. Okay. Yeah. He's good. He's good. He's good. Oh, right. I want to talk to him in a minute. He's good. He's good. Right. Those two, 
oh, right, there's a general theme that this is something that we're struggling with, right, this might be a point that I make the entire group a cue that gets shouted at the, the, the larger group. It could be that there's one or two individuals that need something a bit more bespoke. And that's uh, when they're walking back from their fly runs in their recovery. I then just go run to them. Okay, when we're doing that, think about, okay, again, we're super tense in your upper body. Think about how your upper body silent, lower body violent. That's going to help you relax. We still want to like hit down like a piston, but I want your upper body a little bit more, a little bit more relaxed. The other guy who, yeah, might need a different cue. He's walking back and he's in the second group. So you, you then get to him right right okay when you're um accelerating at the minute you're in a way too upright position and we need to get better shin angles so actually okay can you get into a more loaded position right and that's a small conversation if it's a big problem then i'd tell the whole group so it's going in that like micro to macro and zooming in zooming out um having larger coaching groups is obviously a, a bit tougher but then once you once you have if you do have like a second or a third coach with you, it's either splitting them off into groups or having, say, a lead coach and then a, a secondary coach. So the lead coach might always be the guy that's setting the entire message and shepherding the group from area to area. Whereas the secondary coach, he's the guy that can get into the details, who's pulling a guy aside and being like, right, OK, like really getting into the into the nitty gritty of, OK, like making sure that the the guy understands what he's doing why he's doing it and that hopefully chasing down that light bulb moment where he's improving that movement skill um and that's something that i found quite often i was finding myself uh in seasons past i was very much the macro coach who was trying to take and shepherd the entire group whereas actually at times like i missed being able to just take a guy aside for a couple minutes and work on something slightly different and then send them back into the group and so having the the larger coach groups here now allows somebody else to maybe take that role as the lead coach and I can get into the detail and really, really um, hopefully make improvements with, with someone's someone's movement in terms of speed. So, Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for that uh, thorough insight. And you can really start to visualize how that can um, flow quite nicely in terms of keeping the group moving and, and getting their prep for their main session, but, but also some, whether you're giving some one-on-one -on -one individual advice um, or some group, um, feedback but when when you do have the luxury of four to five coaches uh, and for those listening that have that uh, luxury what what type of buckets do you like to group athletes into uh, and how does that sort of rotate is it like a three-way three-minute rotation one coach one each station or, or yeah talk us through how that looks so we actually um rather than being like right, okay you've got one guy who's doing this drill one guy who's doing this drill that's linked more towards this bucket and they get exposure to all Mm -hmm. um, one coach would take that group for the entirety of the session. Um, so this preseason, we, we split guys into, into three groups, uh, a stiffness, a physical and a technical group. Um, and like we stressed that that wasn't necessarily that all that, for example, in the stiffness group, uh, you, you can picture straight away that they would need to do maybe some more like plyometrics, um, type, type work. That wasn't necessarily that they did all plyometrics and, didn't do anything else. It was just that more of their training was biased towards doing stiffness uh, type activities. Um, so yeah, that, that was how we split them in preseason based off of uh, some profiling that we did. Uh, and then in season now we've actually split. So we do a, a little bit more uh, resisted speed work in our, in our prep um, at the minute in, in the current block of training. Um, and we've almost split it based off of equipment. So like we, and what role they play in the team. So like our main ball carriers that are going to be our frontline players, they get access to the 1080 where it's a little bit more bespoke around the loads that they're working with and the feedback that we're getting and driving in like training intent that way. Uh, and then some of our other guys are working on the run rocket with uh, timing gates. So they're still getting some exposure to resisted speed, but it's maybe not quite as in depth. And then some of our Academy younger guys, they're, working doing banded resisted work or pushing prowlers and things like that that's maybe less objective but again they're probably earlier in their learning curve where actually they don't necessarily need just the stimulus they need actually the education around okay what's going on at their like for their shin angles what's going on for like, are they attacking back what's their projection like are they are their, are their hips traveling forwards and they might need a little bit more coaching that way Whereas some of the older guys who are our frontline players, they've had exposure of this for a few years. 
They hopefully are a little bit better technically. Um, they just need to come in and they, they need their stimulus uh, in a short period of time because they're the guys that we're going to be playing. They're the guys that are going to be playing on the Saturday. So they need to get in, do it. Not necessarily minimal effective dose, but optimal dose and get out. Whereas they say the younger guys need more, they are more longer term development projects where actually you take a hit on the stimulus you give guys to get across the message and the education and the understanding of the movement skill. Um, so that's how we split the groups at the minute. Uh, yeah. And then in the next block, we might again go back to reassessing from our profiling and then looking at then, okay, all right, this guy needs a little bit more of this. This guy needs a little bit more of that. Yeah. And, and flowing on from that, uh, you mentioned blocks and current phases of doing resistance sprint work. What sort of key blocks do you think you need to tick off for, for a field-based team sports, whether it be soccer, rugby, or, or Australian rules football, which is similar in, in nature? Whether from a sprinting point of view, uh, yeah, what are some of your key phases in season uh, when you're playing um, on a weekly basis? Yeah, so like I think our pre-season I take the focus of we get a lot more training time. So that's where we do the most education where um, also as well, it links towards in season, they do a lot of meetings. So they're, get, they're getting talked at a lot, whereas in pre-season, there's less of that. So that's where we can set our stall out. We'll be in front of the big screen explaining, okay, the why and what, like using analogies, trying to uh, layer that learning down Um then once we get in season, ideally what we don't want to do is give them something that they already have, which is sat down being talked at. So ideally when we're in season, we're straight to it and we're delivering um, as soon as we can. Um, so that's a, that's a key point. Um, yeah. I'd say in, in terms of the blocks, sometimes it's just driven off of like, okay, it has, has this thread, kind of reached its natural end like other players a little bit bored of it has it lost some of its resonance with the player uh have we tapped out that stimulus in terms of all right guys aren't really improving anymore um and then we then change it up uh like again because if you if you're stuck with time sometimes like let's say you have like 10 minutes to prep guys that's not a lot of time to tick off acceleration max velocity get some stimulus get some learning education. Actually, sometimes it's better just going, you know what, in this block right now, we're going to be focused on acceleration. Um, and that's where we're going to spend most of our, most of our training time. Um, yeah. Like I, I think in the middle of winter, we probably spend a lot more time doing resistance to speed, working on projection, working on the acceleration. Why? Well, the pitches that we play on are slightly softer. It's, it's going to be more of an acceleration based game that we play. And then come summer is when we open up a little bit more. We spend a lot more time revisiting some of the max velocity work that, we, that we've been doing in terms of the education, at least, um, when we're playing on faster tracks. Um, so, yeah, we might block more of that work later in the year. Um, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that we don't give them the exposure to max velocities. We know like from a hamstring uh, injury prevention perspective, we've got to keep that uh, top end speed exposure, ideally weekly. Um, so we don't lose that. But it just mm. might be we're doing all that acceleration work into a max V effort rather than, OK, some acceleration work. Right now we're going to do some dribbles and some scissor drills and spend a lot of time looking at some of the education around how to like run at top speed effectively. It might just be right. We park that and we're just going to do a fly run just to get, get you the exposure because we're pushed for time. Yep, yep. And you mentioned using uh, analogies at times to get the um, get the technical um, feedback across. What's your sort of balance, or if, if there is one, what's your sort of take on um, implicit learning, uh, explicit feedback, and then uh, bringing in analogies um, for, for speed yeah. development? Is it What are some key considerations, whether it be the, who is the athlete in front of you um, in terms of developing athlete or a more senior athlete, or is it other things that you take into account? Yeah, I think I think a blended approach. Again, that's the boring answer, but it, it's true. Like I think you can. Again, I, I'm big on CLA and constraints led approach and um, the like ecolog ecological way of uh, of learning and stuff. Um, but I think you can go too far down that way. You leave a little bit of bread on the table if you're if you're just like dogmatically we're just completely task driven, and I'm a passenger and I just set up the task and let the players solve problem solve completely themselves i think actually you can you can uh 
yeah, expedite someone's learning a little bit quicker with, okay, that you can see they might not be self-organizing um, based off of the task that they're doing. And they need that little bit of a nudge of explicit feedback of like, okay, I want you doing it like this. Or in the same way, you can still be explicit, but questioning in your approach. So you challenge that that deeper level of thought. So it might be that you're quite explicit. It's like, why do I want you like this? And then you that, that then at least puts it a little bit more on the player. So you're not just going, I want you like this, do it like this. It's, okay, why do I want you like that? Uh, okay, I, I want to, to use our pelvic position um, like example. Okay, well, why do I want um, your, your pelvic position tucked underneath you? Oh, because well, that unlocks more front side lift. Okay, why is that important? Oh, because then I can draw the hammer high. All right, well, why is that important? Well, if I get the hammer high, I get more time to generate force so I can whack the ground. Perfect. More force. What does that equal? More force equals more speed. Brilliant. Lovely. Now we've got learning. Right. Now let's go back to the same drill. Let's see if we can nail this pelvic position. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, like, don't get me wrong. Like some explicit um, feedback is good. Um, but yeah, wherever possible, I'm trying to use like I, I'm a big analogy guy um, where 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 we like where I can use it. Um, but you've got to be aware that sometimes the analogy might make sense in your head, but it doesn't in in the players. Um, I, I like Nick Winkleman said that like an analogy and uh, is is like a is like a Trojan horse um, that it carries three, four, five, six, seven, eight other things around it. So like yeah. again, I might I might say hammer high. Uh, or like strike the ground like a hammer and then underpinning that might be pelvic position it might be feeling that um what's going on at the at the pelvis that might be the tilt of the pelvis that might be then the force that might be linked to whipping from the hip and it's just that one word that unlocks six or seven other things that i might have said that, that's linked to that um and i think it's also finding analogies that resonate with the player um, so like I'm a big movie analogy guy uh, where I can, but like you cycle through like you do with all cues, like you say one thing and you, it lands with three guys and you get blank looks from another another group. Um, so it's then just going, OK, OK, that hasn't resonated with them. But how do I get it to resonate for these guys? So an example would be um, in preseason this year, uh, sorry, two years ago. I was right when everyone was playing Call of Duty just out of lockdown. Um, and so I wanted to get across getting into a good position and acceleration. And we call that a, a loaded position. Uh, so that means that they've got like, there's actual, like they've taken the slack out of the system. They got into a good shin angle position. They're ready to push out of that project out of that position um, rather than being stood upright with a poor shin angle where they have to take that drop step to get into a good projected position to take the slack out of the system. So the, the analogy that we used was like, imagine you're, they all were gaming with each other. It's like, imagine you're, you're gaming, right? And you're coming around the corner in Call of Duty. If I have my finger on the trigger, can I shoot straight away? Yes, right. Now imagine you're holding the controller with one hand and your right, right hand, which is the trigger finger to shoot, is away. Can you shoot? Yes, but what do you need to do first? You need to get that hand to the controller. That's time lost, taking the slack out of the system, getting ready. So what do you do when you play? And they're all like, yeah, I'm sat at the edge of my sofa and my fingers are like ready, 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 ready. Exactly. That's the same position that I want you here. So when we're doing this drill, it could be just like a five meter acceleration. I want you loaded. I want your finger on that trigger, ready, ready. So as soon as I shout go, you don't have to take the slack out of the system. You can get to projecting straight away. That, that analogy there suddenly unlocked like four or five of the younger guys. They're like, oh, yeah, it makes sense now. Yeah, perfect. And it's like, finger on the bam. trigger. Exactly, <laughs> finger on the trigger. And so then, like, we solidify that learning. So, like, the, when we were reviewing some of the footage in the top left hand corner, it's just a picture of a PlayStation controller. Again, I'm talking about loaded positions, but they're seeing a PlayStation controller. Yep. They, again, that, that's that Trojan horse. They see the PlayStation controller. They're like, yep. Yeah, I know, I know what that means. Um, yeah yeah yeah. Um, having having stores of those um for your certain topics uh uh, yeah a big for getting across uh your points and uh, yeah and solidifying that learning a little bit better i think you you mentioned earlier um when got blocking out your your programming um when results um start to plateau or or the group starts to lose engagement you'll start to move on and speaking from the results point of view you mentioned um, speed gates um is that something that you sort of reference in terms of looking at max velocity or, or their acceleration and, and talk us through some, I guess, expected results that you'd get, whether it be in pre-season or season with a particular squad or, or players that you're focusing on during that um, block? 
yeah so we'll try and like we use our data probably more as an intent driver than like to do some super high depth analysis but at the same time it is nice to track longitudinally and be like right okay what we've been working on has made improvements um but at the same time it's understanding that like learning isn't a linear process so actually sometimes you might have got that point across to a player they might have better movement mechanics but they might run slower in that moment and they're like what well, i've done all this stuff and you've you said that this would make me quicker and i'm running slower why and it's like well again learning is messy and like it takes time for for you to understand how to run consistently with those mechanics or if you've worked on the physical side of things with with that new engine that you've you've tuned up you might not know how to drive the car yet. So like, actually it takes time and exposure to get reps to drive that car. And that's where having data that's captured consistently, even if it's just in the background is, is, is quite key. So yeah, we'll use, we'll usually run guys through the gates like weekly uh, and then we'll, we'll take split so we can uh, let's see whether someone's, whether we need to work more on acceleration or max velocity for someone. And we have the 1080 that allows us to do like some real in-depth analysis. Um, we use the GPS a fair bit just because again we can capture that in situ in 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 training and in games and so like there's that age-old question that coaches are oh, yeah, they've got faster through the gates but i don't see them any faster on the field and it's like right actually like the gps answers that question a little bit more of like right okay they're accessing more of their top speed more regularly they're making more more sprints uh so like the the number of sprints that they're making is higher or but the the amount of uh exposure above 90 percent or whatever like even if their uh, pb hasn't gone up actually i'm bringing up the the floor rather than the ceiling so like they're more readily able to access above 85 percent above 90 percent even if they haven't like run at 102 percent they're just able to operate in that top top zone uh a little bit more freely a little bit more readily um so yeah we'll use the gps feedback and celebrate the wins where we can so uh, again yeah, if, if guys are running pbs we'll let them know about it on on our uh, like we've got a big TV in the gym and a uh, PowerPoint presentation that just cycles around with, um, yeah, like leaderboards and um, yeah, what guys are working on. And then, and then one of the key things that we, we do try is, is to close the loop with actually showing like game speed in, in action. So whether that's in game or in training, like when guys have been able to show off their speed in, in game actions uh, is, is key, I think, to solidify that message that it's not just about, capturing data and us being a sprint club we're a rugby club at the end of the day and it needs to transfer to those to those things on the field and that that then uh yeah shows that like yeah it's it's a full process that the it's not just about doing drills it's about yeah transferring it to the skill as well and that gets the coaches more involved because they're then more interested in how the speed program is influencing what's happening on the rugby field and yeah like it's it, yes it's good from that perspective and some good learning as well from the coaches can then give you feedback of like actually like this drill isn't as contextual as you think it is this it needs to be more like this or actually that's a really good idea but have you thought about the defender coming from this angle or the attacker having a support player here there and it then improves your delivery of of those more contextual sessions yeah yeah i was going to ask you about that with adding the like you mentioned the end point starting with that and working back from that with your warm-up prep uh, how much would you lean on the co the tactical technical coaches with um, those uh, yeah, closing the loop at, and and how does that sort of uh, transfer to the to the game? Do you feel by involving those yeah. um, coaches? I think I think first of all, yeah, you like you got to take what are they being prepped for. So that warm up is going into the session. So if if in the session it's a high contact demand session, well, it makes sense that your warm up might tick off or prep guys for little bits of that if they're going into a fast session where they're playing on in open spaces on the edge and they're playing fast and they might be involved in large amounts of kick chase well that screams to me that that's a max velocity type session that you might be prepping them for um if it's a uh, I don't know, uh, yeah, a clarity session that's a bit more low key and they've just come off of a tough weekend loss. Actually, that might be where the main focus might be like, right, can we G the boys up? Can we get a bit more energy? Like, And fun might be the driver of what you do. That doesn't mean that then you're just, you're just having fun and that's it. Like you can still link some of your speed outcomes to, to speed as to, to the fun. Um, but like, you just got to be a bit more creative. So like an example of that would be, um, one of the games that we play 
Um, so if, when, we, when we work on agility, it's like a 15 on 15, so 15 by 15 square, and you've got guys lined up on one corner and the other corner, and you get them to run across. Obviously, there's so much traffic that they have to evade and get across, and so they're racing to each other. They're doing that. That's a little bit more fun. But then, right, okay, if you're wanting to work on agility or speed, but you just want to add something a little bit stupid into it. So we have a, a rubber chicken um, and we throw the rubber chicken up in the middle and then wherever the head lands is the side you've got to go to. So no one really knows which side they go to and it's complete chaos and they're bumping into each other and they're laughing and joking, pulling each other back. But I'm still getting, because they're racing, I'm still getting a 10 meter acceleration. It's just hidden amongst this stupid rubber chicken game. Um, yeah. And so that might be something I would do when the group needs it. If I'm super in on like, right, okay, it's a more of an education focused session. The rubber chicken stays in my drawer and I'm maybe looking at, okay, like, okay, all right, we're going to the wall and we're, we're getting into the nitty gritty of the mechanics. Um, but yeah, the decision-making is driven by, I think, what what's to come. And so I, I think having the coaches here to know what the session plan is, what they're trying to work on, what some of the themes that they're trying to work on are, then help because then you can actually layer on some of the, some of the precursors for that. And like some of my kind of best moments as a coach have been when the coaches have come across and they've parroted some of the things that I've said, or like mm. they've gone into that session and be like, right, look lads, when we're in this kit chase, are oh, we loaded? And you're like, Fuck, we just, we just worked on that. And like that position that we wanted to work on the coaches is now the coaches are now referencing. And that then closes the loop even more because here's the guy who picks the team and he's calling guys out for not being loaded. So when they come to do the session next week, they're going to be a lot more bought in to the positions that I, that I want them to be in. So yeah, th those, 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 when those moments occur, it's, it's, it's really cool. I think. Yeah. Last one for the, for the athletes listening in, or maybe parents of, of young athletes that are wanting to get faster. So young developing uh, athletes, anywhere from that sort of 14 to 17 years of age, uh, what are certain key big rocks that you'd like to see in a program over across your week uh, for developing speed at that age group? I think it sounds stupid, but to get fast, you have to run fast. So making sure that you're getting regular exposure to true sprinting. Uh, and that's not coach Carter style sprints where you're under loads of fatigue. It should be sprinting while you're fresh. So with large rest periods um, and being progressive with it. So like, again, if you've never run over 40 meters before, that's a bit risky. If you're all of a sudden deciding to do 10 reps of 40 meters, um, so be progressive with building up what you're doing um, in terms of the distances and the volumes, and then just be aware of like some of the positions that you that you're getting in. So actually use those like the drills that you might do, like do them like purposefully with intent. So don't just like okay, I just do a skips because that's what everyone does for warm ups. Like, what is the a skip doing in terms of layering your pelvic position or your torso position? Uh, how are we? like working on whipping from the hip when we're doing an A march, like rather than it just being a bit like passive and like actually be purposeful with, with what you're doing. Um, and I guess as I would do with a, as, as a coach, like I've got my, my sort of technical model and everything is linked back to that. And so like all the drills that you're doing are linked back to that technical model. So like in acceleration, it's um, to do with projection and attacking back. So what does that mean? That means we spoke about the loaded position. It's being in a loaded position. So that allows you to get into a good shin angle position to push with your hips, project out forwards horizontally. That's the first bit. That's the first step. And then attacking back. What does that mean? That means reversing the action, that scissor-like action of your hip back down to the ground to maintain that good shin angle position on the second step. That then allows you to project off of that second step and build through your acceleration. So there's your your main kind of technical things. So then when you're doing wall drills, am I in a good shin angle position or am I upright? If I'm not, then, okay, am I being purposeful with my prep before I go into my accelerations? No, okay, and I nail that. All right, okay, now I'm doing a speed and I'm doing a resisted run, whether that's with a band or with a sled on me. Okay, I wanna really project my hips forward and can I maintain that good shin angle position? That's where I'm linking it back to all the time. Uh, at top end speed, what's my model? Again, I've spoken a lot about pelvic position so I can get that hammer high, that front side position. So again, I get bigger knee lift so I can attack the ground from above. And then my second point is I stay relaxed in my torso. Why? 
Okay, because if I stiffen up, I'm going to run slower and I'm going to run with poor mechanics. So one of the things that we see, um, we saw in preseason, actually, when we were building guys up with our with our fly runs, uh, when we told guys to relax from the GPS, like we were asking guys, say, to run between 90 and 95 uh, percent. And they were like stiffened up in the first run and they ran like, say, 90 percent. We're like, right, really good. But just relax when you're at top speed. So upper body silent, lower body violent. So the lower body is where we get the stiffness. Our upper body stays relaxed. They ran the same. And they were like, I was like, how did that feel? They're like, I felt like I ran slow. You're like, well, the GPS actually says you ran 97% of your max velocity. And they're like, what? It's like, see, because running relaxed in your upper body unlocks that extra gear of speed. And so getting the players to understand that, then all of a sudden they now know, okay, actually staying relaxed in my upper body is going to help me at top end speed, which as rugby players, like again, all they see is tense, more force all the time, whereas actually at top end speed, it's, it's almost the opposite, like where being more relaxed allows you to run faster. Um, mm. So yeah, f- focusing on those key things and linking it back to everything you're doing in the drills and in your prep is linked to that technical model of what you're working on. So be purposeful with, with, your, with your prep and then making sure you're getting regular exposure to, to that stimulus, whether that's a maximal acceleration stimulus, say so like a 10 meter acceleration, getting a couple of them in, and then a maximal max velocity stim, which might be a, a couple of fly runs or 40 meter runs um, yeah, over, over bigger distances. Perfect. Well, there you go. So those listening in uh, athletes, you don't need much, just a power band and uh, your own body, and you can start attacking those drills. Like you said, the most important thing is to actually sprint uh, and then work on those technical models, accelerations, and top-end speed. Well, thank you so much, Pete, for jumping on early in the morning over in your world. So I really appreciate before a day's work, you jumping on onto the podcast. For those that want to um, uh, follow up with any questions or queries, where's the best place to get in contact, mate? Um, probably Twitter. So like I'm fairly active on Twitter, but that's yeah at Pete Burridge, B-U-R-R-I-D-G-E. Um, yeah. So yeah, th- throw me some questions out there and yeah, happily try and answer them or, or, or find someone that can answer them or yeah. So yeah, feel free to contact me there and yeah, happy to uh, answer questions there. And yeah, I post some of the stuff regarding speed um, on, on my Twitter at times. Um, so yeah, you can kind of see sometimes it's, it's hard over a podcast to, uh, it makes sense in my head, but it's hard to visualize at times. So actually seeing what we do in action is, is probably probably better for some of your listeners to actually see um, what I'm kind of trying to talk about. Absolutely. Yeah. For those listening in, might be driving, listening to the podcast, we'll add um, Pete's Twitter handle in the show notes so you can easily access that and uh, yeah, give him a follow and, and reach out if there's any questions. But thank you again for jumping on and providing such an insight into uh, what clearly a topic that you're passionate about, mate. So it's great to have you on and, and talk about speed development with field-based athletes. I know I got a lot out of it from a strength conditioning point of view, and I'm sure the listeners did, both coaches and athletes. Uh, so thank you so much for jumping on, Pete. And for those tuned in, the, tune into our live chats, our next one is with Nick Kane. On the 15th of November at 4.30 p.m., he's the head physiotherapist at SM Football Club. So I'll see you guys then. Thanks again.